Hi, everybody. My name is Natalie Yeadon, and I'm one of the co-owners and CEOs with Impetus Digital. At Impetus Digital, we have built some of the best-in-class asynchronous and synchronous virtual collaboration tools and digital services for advisory boards, co-author working groups, medical education, internal meetings, and all kinds of different sorts of events. However, at Impetus, we really believe that um, most importantly, that everything starts with great ideas and these really start with conversations. Our online collaboration platform is really the perfect place for not only starting these conversations, but for continuously building on the ideas and insights generated over time and creating really authentic relationships with the participants in the process. Having these big, hairy, audacious conversations is how we can start to implement change and positively disrupt healthcare. So with all of that said, the idea behind this webinar series is to start the conversation around some of these big or controversial ideas and to discuss opportunities with some of these thought leaders, digital provocateurs, healthcare leaders, um, with these opportunities and issues in the health that the healthcare industry is facing today and deciding how technology is going to be help, helping in the process. So I'm really be able, uh, really excited and pleased to have Alison Gaw with me today. Um, Alison Gaw is an experienced life science and drug development business professional. She has over 10 years of experience in the business development and strategy area, working in data and fin financial analytics and project management. She's very passionate and, and has a, about driving the advancement of promising scientific research and great technology towards the development and commercialization to make a difference for patients and doctors. She has a master's degree in biological sciences from Stanford University, and she also has that really nicely packed in an MBA in healthcare management from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Originally from the US, um, Allison actually now resides in Vancouver, Canada. So she's in Canada now, where she is acting as the executive director of corporate and business development at a company called Chinook Therapeutics. This is actually a clinical stage biopharmaceutical company that's discovering, developing, and commercializing precision medicine specifically for rare and severe chronic kidney diseases. So welcome, Allison. So happy to have you on the show. Thank you, Natalie. Really uh, happy to be here and talk about uh, a, a bunch of the issues, as you mentioned, that are affecting the healthcare space here in Canada, but also globally. I'd love to. But before we get started, it, it you know we usually see the opposite direction of people with their career trajectories starting in Canada, kind of blossoming and blooming, and then you know moving to the U.S. of the big land of of the able and the opportunity. Tell us a little bit about your trajectory and how you ended up here in Vancouver. Yeah, so I, I moved to Vancouver roughly about seven or eight years ago. And my move was for personal reasons and not professional. I didn't know much about the life sciences and, and the healthcare scene here in Vancouver when I moved, um, but I quickly discovered it. And it was really nice to discover that there was um, a uh, vibrant life sciences scene here in uh, Vancouver. You know, I think everything is very cyclical. Um, and so when I moved in roughly 2013, I would say that there might have been a little bit of a downswing. Some of the big companies that uh, had been here in the past, um, like QLT or Angiotech, um, were no longer thriving. But in its place were actually a lot of little companies, um, great science coming from UBC and other places. Um, and that have now since become really large successful companies in Vancouver, like Zymeworks. Um, and then you've got Arinia on the island as well. And so I think that that was a nice discovery. And I've worked at a number of the small biotech companies since moving to Vancouver. Um, but really that's, that's what I saw. And, and I think the transition was made um, pretty easily because the cultural similarities between San Francisco Bay Area, where I was from, and Vancouver were there. Um, and I think that's why there is even naturally today a, a pretty tight connection between the two life sciences communities in those two cities. Um, you have people who are really engaged, who are really interested in science, in technology. You have people who are very open to international ideas, 
and then people who are, you know, just, um, you know, a nice casual relationship between work and play, um, spending a lot of times outdoors and in, in the beautiful scenery that we have in both locations. Absolutely, no doubt about it. And one of the things that's really interesting about Chinook Therapeutics is really the focus area, which seems to be a core concentrated, um, like if you will, uh, focus for many pharmaceutical and biotech companies today. And that is in you know, usual areas like oncology, rare diseases, very specific biomarkers, like a precise medicine type of format, Tell us a little bit about why this has become such an such an emphasis for companies and biotech companies that are that are starting and trying to compete today. Yeah, and so you know, throughout my career, I've worked in many therapeutic areas. Um, as you mentioned, oncology um, was one very common, um, as well as immunology, rheumatoid arthritis. But kidney diseases for me was actually quite new, um, and was, I was really excited to join Chinook in that time. And really the idea was that this was an area where there was a huge amount of unmet medical need. Um, chronic kidney diseases cost our healthcare systems in North America well over a hundred billion dollars. Um, but really there are no treatments to prevent progressive kidney decline. Uh, really it's about waiting and seeing until you have uh, end-stage renal disease and need dialysis or transplantation. So that's really where the idea to Mountain Chinook two years ago came from. Um, and part of it was applying that precision medicine lens that you mentioned that had been so successful in oncology to kidney diseases. And one of the reasons why uh, this is an area that a lot of companies are moving into, you know, not only applying precision medicine in oncology, but also other diseases like kidney diseases, um, CNS or neurology indications is because historically, doing clinical trials, doing, um, trying to treat patients in these patient populations were very difficult because you had very heterogeneous patient populations. So without understanding the underlying disease condition and what's driving the disease and, and whether or not that's actually the same or different between different patients, it was very difficult to identify and test and find successfully a therapeutic that would work for large patient populations. And so for these non-specific drugs, you were running clinical trials that were you know, 5,000 patients. They were five years long um, before you actually had a result and you knew whether or not you were successful or not. And in most cases, they were not successful. Um, so it made it very difficult to um, get anything approved through the regulators that could then help patients. So I think that's really why Precision Medicines and, and why Chinook Therapeutics was founded is to, to, to really be able to get drugs to market to patients and knowing that they are gonna help a select and very specific group because we understand the biology now. We'd be remiss not to discuss the most pivotal thing that has ever happened in most of our lifetimes for, for most people. And that is the COVID-19 pandemic and the social contagion and you know all of the economic upheaval that has happened as a result. And we're still going through this, right? So, you know, again, even the differences of how we're managing this, you know, you can compare Canada, the US and multiple other global um, entities. But obviously there's been a huge impact on the pharmaceutical industry. Tell us a little bit about what that impact was um, on Chinook Therapeutics, but how you interpreted this in general for the pharmaceutical industry. Yeah, it, it was a really interesting year in, in 2020. So. With a lot of the companies here in Vancouver, as I mentioned, there's a really strong connection between um, Vancouver and, and the cities down in California. But actually for Chinook, we were founded as a dual headquartered company between Seattle and Vancouver. So half of our employees are here in Vancouver, half were in Seattle. So the disruption with COVID and the closing of the border actually was a really huge impact last March. And uh, you know, we used to be traveling up and down between the two sites. Um, leadership was doing that on a weekly, if not bi-weekly basis. And that of course had to stop. And so it really forced us to find other ways of doing business and other ways of continuing to stay in touch. Um, and I think that that's what the healthcare space has done overall. In fact, you know, really things and business and deal-making uh, and the development of drugs hasn't stopped. In fact, it really accelerated in 2020. And this was not only looking for drugs and vaccines for COVID-19, 
but all of the companies such as ourselves in Chinook that don't necessarily have a direct product or a de direct drug that we're looking in COVID-19, we continued our business, you know, and, and actually accelerated um, our business. You know, we were a company that was roughly 40 people um, at the beginning of 2020 when the pandemic started. We're now well over 80. Um, and so we've continued to grow, uh, build our pipeline of uh, drugs that are in the clinic and preclinical space. And I think that just, as I said, it was just about finding new ways of, of doing things, finding new ways to connect to people within the company, but also to connect with business partners um, throughout the country, throughout North America, as well as the world. So tell us a little bit about the impacts on clinical trials. So their clinical trials are never going to be the same. And we hear a lot around the push for decentralized trials using COVID-19 as the accelerant for that adoption. There's been a lot of questions around the types of endpoints that we're using in clinical trials and ensuring that they're resilient enough or that they're enabled so patients can actually do some of the self-reporting. There's discussions of using types of, uh, of measurement tools that you know, incorporate it through things like wearables and sensors and uh, ambient biometric tools. So tell us a little bit about how that sort of thinking has impacted or will impact what Chinook or other pharmaceutical companies will do with clinical trials in the future. Yeah, I, I think as you said, a lot of these ideas have been percolating uh, even before COVID um, and we're starting to have discussions and being implemented and really COVID has accelerated. I don't think it's caused the change, but it's really accelerated the shift and the change in that regard. For clinical trials, one of the really important things has always been compliance. Um, so patients, as you said, with patient reported outcomes, you know, how much can we trust them? Um, in that regard, if they're not being supervised by a clinician, they're not requiring site visits um, where you can take objective measurements such as lab values. So that has historically been the concern. And with technology these days, we've definitely been able to start addressing some of those concerns. With patient reported outcomes, for example, you know, a lot of the questionnaires or the quizzes can now be done on a tablet, right, that the patient is given at the beginning of the trial, and they're asked to fill in a diary every day, and that diary is actually sent uh, the data to the investigators on a daily basis. So you don't have the concern that, oh, the patient wrote everything the day before the office visit and then brought it in because you know that it's being sent on a daily basis through the tablets. I think with COVID-19, one of the things that is actually really accelerated is how do we make sure that we can get things done without patients traveling to the clinic sites, which occasionally may be two or three hours away. And so this has really, um, you know, we're taking a look for a lot of our trials at home health visits, for example. Um, so where, you know, maybe not doctors, but there are a lot of nurse uh, practitioners and nurse companies that can then be sent to the patient's site uh, and pay to their to their home. Um, so you get uh, a you know one-on-one -on -one relationship as well as um, patients not having to travel as often. So I think there's a lot of these practices that are being put in place that are being accelerated through the need for social distancing with COVID-19, but really were things that the ideas and the technology for it existed before then. Absolutely. And so it's just finding finding those basically the silver lining when sometimes things look like a challenge, there can sometimes be really beneficial things. And it's really about change management. So what's interesting here as well, too, is we were talking a little bit about products that are considered rare diseases, oncology products that sometimes don't really bubble to the top. They're not top of mind for the average citizen. We've heard a lot during this pandemic that be, because of the huge array and amplification of everything having to do with COVID, diseases and very, very life-threatening conditions like cancer have actually been put on the back burner. People, for example, have not been getting the diagnosis and you know, perhaps there's gonna be a gigantic bolus as a result. How does this potentially impact um, Chinook therapeutics, especially as it considers rare disorders where people may not be getting the appropriate diagnosis at the right time, is this going to be a problem? 
I do unfortunately think it is a problem. I think it's it's not only oncology that you've mentioned that we are hearing stories um, in which uh, diagnoses are being delayed um, because patients can't get into the hospitals for their tests, for the MRIs and the CTs. Um, and so unfortunately, I do think it's a problem. I, I, we hear it stories with even childhood vaccinations um, with things like measles or chicken pox. Um, you know, families aren't, aren't bringing their kids in or they're, they're, either, they're either afraid to or they actually just don't have the ability to because the clinics are closed. Um, and down in that regard. And so I do think that this is going to be a problem. Um, it is something that I think as an industry that we will have to continue to work on both education, um, encouraging people not to uh, give up on care, encouraging folks to get checked out and see their doctors when they're not feeling well, uh, and not to be afraid of, of doing that because of COVID-19. And I think also as an industry that we will have to work on, you know, what are alternative technologies that would then really allow some of this work to continue on despite the pandemics, in spite of the hospitals being at capacity for COVID-19, right? As, and that would be electronic health management records, these home health visits by nurse practitioners. I think as an industry, we need to start looking at ways of adopting these programs, working with regulators and uh, agencies to make sure that everything stays safe um, and say, stays private. I think data privacy is a huge issue, which is one of the barriers that has been in place for the adoption of some of these technologies in, in the last few years. And I think that will continue to be a concern. You brought up a really interesting point about needing to be innovative and resourceful enough to find alternative methodologies for the diagnostic piece of it. I mean, let alone the treatments. I mean, they're available and you know, we're hearing all about uh, pharmacies delivering and, you know, there, there's lots of different ways of kind of filling that gap in, but the diagnosis is, is the core component. So we're hearing a lot about these things called, you know, liquid biopsies, which is really this idea of, you know, saliva tests or blood tests. There's all kinds of genetic sequencing and all kinds of people are doing all kinds of things. You know, again, this has been accelerated by the, the, the rapid testing for COVID-19 and other yeah. sorts of things. Is that on the forefront, perhaps for conditions um, like rare diseases or, or kidney disease, et cetera? Is that something that we can see uh, in the not so distant future? I think that that definitely is a consideration. I think it's just a it's difficulty. Um, you know, with kidney diseases, one of the issues is, is met, many of those diseases um, are require biopsies for confirmatory or diagnosis. And, and that's a very invasive procedure. Um, and it's definitely something that is very difficult um, to do in this day and age and environment uh, of COVID-19. With liquid biopsies for oncology, you know, that's, the, that's an area where the unmet need was there, which was very similar biopsies were done in tumors um, and people wanted to try to avoid that. And tumors in oncology, they shed cells um, that are in the bloodstream or in the saliva. And so that was that enabled the technology to say, okay, we know that these cells are there in the bloodstream. Now, how do we detect them at a strong enough level? We haven't found those types of biomarkers yet for kidney diseases. We're starting to, and of course, for kidney diseases, most of those biomarkers are in the urine as opposed to the blood, um, given the role of the kidney. And so there are definitely biomarkers that are starting to come about, um, but it really only applies to small number of rare diseases right now within the kidney disease space. And so that is the challenge that we have um, specifically at Chinook and, and with kidney diseases compared to something else like oncology is, is what are those biomarkers and, and how do we you know, understand the diseases to then be able to look for them um, without the biopsy diagnosis. And I think that that's something that is coming um, probably more in the medium to long term than the near term as we've seen with oncology. When we think about rare diseases and these very uber, you know, focused condition like therapeutic areas, there's not a lot of patients in them. These are like niche target areas. So products are very expensive, but they're but they're very focused and and they're very efficacious for those particular um, patients. Now, with all of that said, is there's you know we've learned a lot from COVID nineteen about what's possible and what's not. In the typical regulatory environment, 
Um, we see, you know, a smorgasbord of products that are kind of on the roster and on the list, and everything requires its due diligence time, you know, based on the fact that there's tons of these rare disease products and companies coming from all over the place. Suddenly, COVID-19 appears, and overnight, we're able to, within a few days, approve a product. And then with a, within a few weeks, be able to, you know, find the funding and, you know, and get a, a supply chain. And, you know, there was this huge groundswell of momentum that enabled things that were never before possible. It's sort of like suddenly realizing that you could run a mile in four minutes, and then suddenly the floodgates open. Is this going to pave the way for the new ways that we regulate and approve products and do everything else down the supply chain? Or was that just a one-off for COVID-19? So I, you know, I think there may be different views on this. I personally do think it's a one-off. Um, and I don't necessarily, you know, it was good to remove a lot of the bureaucracy and a lot of the red tape um, in that regard and get things moving quickly because the need was there. I don't think, however, that this is here to stay. Um, I do think that there are some, you know, there are reasons why some of those processes are in place and to be perfectly safe and keep going. And even with the supply chain, we're, you know, right now with COVID-19, um, you know, one of the metaphors that's been used is we're flying the plane as we're building it, right? And so, you know, mistakes are going to be made, things are going to happen, the balls, certain balls are going to be dropped, as you're seeing with the supply chain. And unfortunately, that does result in, you know, waste of resources. Um, I've seen some statistics out there that certain countries have procured enough contracts of vaccines, you know, from a volume point to vaccinate every single one of their um, citizens nine times over, right? That eventually that's going to be a waste if those vaccines are actually delivered and bought by those countries. At some point, you just, you can't, you don't need that much. Um, but that's what's happened because the floodgates were opened, as you said. Um, and I think they needed to, to be able to address this pandemic the way it is. But in the long run, there is going to be problems. So I don't think that it is um, a permanent solution for the way that regulatory and healthcare is run. I think there is, does need to be a balance. Um, and so there are certain definitely red tapes. And I think the regulatory agencies have acknowledged that and that they have worked on that in the past few years, even before COVID-19 happened. You know, as I mentioned, in kidney diseases, in um, in cardiovascular disease and in the um, CNS types of diseases, historically, you know, regulators, the reason that you needed long trials, thousands of patients was because they needed to see endpoints and they needed to see progression. Um, but they're now starting to accept surrogate endpoints and accept biomarkers that we're seeing in the urine, in the blood based for diseases. So they're already making those changes um, and being able to, to kind of match near-term lab-based results with longer term uh, clinical results and progression. And so I think that that was already happening um, and we'll, we'll see that continue to happen, but I, I don't think the floodgates will continue to stay open the way they are for COVID-19. Yeah, and I actually have a tendency to agree with you on, I just don't think that's a sustainable model. <laughs> um, so Allison, you actually sit at a really interesting juxtaposition in the fact that you have very deeply ingrained experience in the US which as you and I both know, having worked at Genentech is a very different animal and beast, the way things function in Canada. And so you have a very interesting perspective on the differences. So even just looking at the whole core around regulatory approvals, timing, what have you noticed as being some of the similarities and what have you noticed as being some of the real major differences? I think the similarities really ultimately is, is that everybody involved in this industry from the scientists to the financing business people to the regulatory folks, everybody's desire is to do the right thing for patients, is to make progress um, and really alleviate the suffering of patients, um, whether or not that's you know curing diseases or, or even preventing them from occurring in the first place. So I think that that is a similarity I do see is, is where everybody is coming from. Um, the differences you know uh, have to do a little bit more with um, 
just kind of how you see the real ultimate goal and in terms of seeing it as a societal goal versus an individual patient goal. I think, you know, some of the stereotypes about Canadians versus Americans are true. Um, I think what I've seen here in Canada is things do tend to work at a much slower or calmer pace um, in that regard. It, you know, it's a, it's a kinder and gentler system um, and folks are, are not um, as aggressive necessarily. Um, but I think part of that is there's also just an inherent trust in Canada. Um, you know, when I moved up here, I knew nobody in the industry, um, you know, and I reached out to Life Sciences BC here in Vancouver. They were a great association that I know that Impetus has recently joined as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, they were great at making facilitations, introductions um, to, to people that I wanted to meet. And every single person I met was willing to make an introduction to somebody else. Um, and so just the trust is there once you have that connection. And I think that that is something that is, is slower and harder to build in the US. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the, the, the best terms that I've heard recently, you know, is that assume good intentions. And here in Canada, I think most relationships and most interactions um, inherently have uh, good intentions underneath them. I think in the US, folks have to be reminded of it or that, that, that people don't naturally think that, you know, they always think, oh, is the other person trying to get you know one up on me you know they're much more competitive in that sense um so you know like i said some of the stereotypes do exist but you can't apply it to everybody you know there are individuals in each country that operate differently yeah beautiful beautiful perspective and i really love that positive um interpretation of it as well which is wonderful to see um what is, you know, was very apparent to me having been on both sides of the border as well is there are some fundamental differences as it relates to Canada being an HTA country, so a health technology assessment country and the US is not. So there's a very different process protocol around access, you know, drug reimbursement and pricing. What was the impact on you having to deal with things like, you know, the Patent Medicines Review Board, PMPRB, and the very, you know, diligent, you know, process through CADETH and PCPA and all these other bodies that have to do this very focused approach of approving and giving access and payment, public payment for products. What was that experience like and how did you compare that to the US experience? Yeah, so that's one of the really interesting things. I've actually not gone through the Canadian system quite yet because we haven't gotten any products at any of the companies I've working through to that stage. But knowing that the system exists has actually very much dictated a lot of long-term marketing strategy for our products and programs. Um, you know, US is always the first country that somebody wants to launch in. Um, and that's because the market is there not only with the number of patients, but also because the, the payer system is, is so open um, in terms of free setting of pricing. Um, you know, and, and next after that comes Europe and Europe has very similar, um, you know, health uh, technology assessment systems with the UK and, and NICE, uh, France adding theirs and even Germany, uh, which used to be much more of a free pricing system adding their evaluations. Um, but again, the population numbers are, are larger and, and are there. And so, but because of that, Canada often, unfortunately, is at the back of the queue um, for companies that are looking to launch products. And so it really is a much more difficult conversation and strategy analysis on, is it worth launching in Canada? Is the population big enough? And is the return going to be sufficient to make sense to go through that time and effort of not only kind of regulatory from a clinical point of view and the actual efficacy and safety, um, which you can you know, use a lot of uh, global resources and um, there, but everything that you have to do on the health technology side and the evaluation on the IP front, the evaluation on the pricing front is actually has to be unique for Canada. You can't leverage anything else from other countries in that regard. And so that unfortunately, you know, is, is, is where Canada sits. And so, as I said, I, I've not actually gone through the process because none of the programs have ever actually gotten that far. Um, and, and Canada is definitely not 
you know, the first consideration, unfortunately. You bring up a very important concept, and that is global country, you know, the global headquarters or the, you know, the global team are always assessing affiliates and the return on investment. And, the, you know, there's always the, the pricing comparisons and the global, you know, baseline and all these sorts of things that one has to go through. Do you feel that in some ways that thinking and the fact that Canada is a small country, the fact that Canada has very stringent pricing regulations and a very uh, difficult process for reimbursement, do you think, and, and also in addition, because of that, not that not that that corners are cut, but sometimes uh, you know provinces or companies may take alternative routes to how they dose or what they're using or or whatever you am using the COVID nineteen as an example. Do you think that this has an impact or had an impact on why we're in the situation with COVID nineteen in Canada? not getting the sufficient number of doses based on some of those other bigger issues that the pharmaceutical industry has had to endure in Canada over the long term? It's hard to say because, you know, I'm not direct, as I said, not directly involved in, in any of the, the COVID-19 um, therapeutics or the vaccines or any of the companies involved there. Um, but I think part of it is, you know, what has driven the uh, procurement it has been relationships. Um, and so, you know, if you have strong relationships between your government and the, the players um, or the governments and the provinces, it makes things a lot simpler and, and, a lot, and it, it, everything, as I said, it comes down to trust. And if you have the trust there, it makes things a lot easier. And so I think, you know, you know because of the problems Canada has had um, in the last couple of years and, you know, in or decades with you know, a lot of the large pharma companies choosing to pull out, there being, you know, more concerns on the IP and the market potential return side of things, you lost a lot of those connections, you lost a lot of that inherent trust. Um, and so, it, you know, it could have contributed to where we are right now. Um, you know, it, it's, I think it's so multifactorial that it's, you know, hard to say one thing is the source or the cause. But I think that, you know, could it have been stronger, it probably could have been. Yeah, it's a very interesting question, and I'm sure something we'll be discussing for years to come. <laughs> um, talking about relationships, um, you had actually mentioned earlier in our conversation that you have your company has doubled in size in one year. And we don't need to go into the specifics about why you were so fortunate that, that happened, but you were obviously hiring and incorporating people without probably even seeing them in person. Tell us a little bit about what was that experience like? And how would you give advice to others who are in, in other similar situation? Yeah, it, it, it's been a really interesting challenge. Um, you know, we had a number of really major key hires last spring that we had done all the interviews for. And then when everything shut down in, in March, we said, okay, you know, we'll, we'll put those hires on hold, right? We don't want them to onboard in the middle of a pandemic when everybody is stay at home orders. But the longer that went on, we realized that that's just not sustainable, right? We can't just stop hiring. We can't, you know, there's work to be done. Um, so a lot of those hires, we did wind up just getting them started and bringing them on board in May and June timeframe. And that includes my business development team. You know, I brought on um, a business development manager in late May, having, you know, we had done luckily all of her interviews in person before this all happened. But really the challenge was, you know, how do we make sure that she's comfortable working, really engaged on an everyday basis? You know, luckily we had a little bit light over lockdown here in Vancouver than other places. And so I was able to, at least on day one, we went into the office, we sat down, right? She got her laptop and technology. We went through and I was able to give her background materials and actual physical papers that I had had, um, but you know, we, we got that day one and then, but after that was, everything was on remote, on TV, um, on Zoom. And, you know, and that's been the case for pretty much everybody within, you know, like every single team has grown since that time. And, you know, our HR um, group is, is consistently thinking even today is, is how do we make sure that all these people 
that um, have joined us stay connected. And particularly the folks that maybe don't have a large department, right? With the, in the departments, it's easier to connect. So what I've found is I have way more kind of weekly one-on-ones with people for the last year than I typically would for a company of this size. You know, I would typically only have one-on-ones with direct reports um, and potentially, you know, senior managers um, or direct line of command or chain of command. But I find now I have one-on-ones with other folks that I work with on a much regular more regular basis who normally I would just interact with pretty regularly or we would just have casual conversations um, in the office, but that doesn't happen. So you have to actually force yourself to get these one-on-ones on a regular basis um, in that regard. So I, you know, I probably have one-on-ones now with half a dozen people, whereas in a normal situation it would be two or three. Um, so I think that's, you know, one of the really big changes and you know, I, I don't think that we've solved for the problem. I think that it will continue to be a problem um, that the whole company is focusing on. Do you see in the future when things get back to semi-normal that the, the reality is going to be hybrid? Meaning will offices be hybrid solutions? Sometimes in the office, sometimes at home. Similarly, do you see the typical things we've always done in person as becoming hybrid? where the people have a choice of being in person or virtual. That includes sales rep visits, medical affairs visits or, or discussions, uh, conferences, corporate events. What do you foresee as being the new normal? Yeah, I, I do think with the office space issue, I do think hybrid is gonna be the new normal. I think it really depends, um, you know, for, for us, we have research labs, we have scientists, right? They're always gonna have to be in person, right? There's, you just can't do experiments on a virtual basis. Um, but for those of us who aren't there, you know, those of us, you know, quote unquote, non-essential workers, but most of us in the, the finance business side of things, you know, we haven't been in the office since the, um, the closures a year ago. Um, and but we miss being there because often a lot of uh, interface between um, the different departments happens in the office. So I do see it as a hybrid. I think folks are recognizing that and, and we were never in this position and most of the biotech companies I've ever worked with have never been nine to five, you know, five days a week, everybody in the office, you know, everybody's typically been pretty flexible, you know, get, as long as you get your work done, um, you know, and, and are available for meetings. Um, you know, they've been pretty understanding. So I do see that that's where more industries are gonna to move to um, that haven't typically been as flexible. Um, I've never seen that problem necessarily with the, any of the biotech companies I've worked with. So I think that that's what we will return to um, is this hybrid situation. In terms of, as you said, kind of the broader way we do business, um, you know, I do think that there are the benefits and you know, there are certain instances in terms of being required to be in person. Um, and that's, you know, with conferences, I have found, you know, it very difficult um, to be as comprehensive and as thorough in some of the conferences as we have um, virtually now than we have in person. A lot of, you know, the content and the scientific learning for conferences that translates very well to virtual. Um, you know, it's easy to learn, um, see posters and see, you know, presentations, but a lot more of conferences with the exhibitors and just the interaction between different companies and different people, um, being able to meet with advisors, scientific boards, that has been really difficult to replace in a virtual setting. Um, I think we're all working on it, but I think that's one thing that we miss quite a bit from conferences um, in that regard. We're trying to solve that by, uh, we're creating something called Insight Events. And we're really trying to, you know, I completely agree having been to lots of these conferences is trying to perfect and integrate the networking and the exhibits and really, really blowing that up. So that's actually something that we're trying to solve at Impetus as well. One of the things I think is really interesting is um, is really your voyage as well too. You know, we we're talking about culture and movement from the U.S. to Canada, but really, you know, the point here is that you are a, a woman who's had leadership positions in some very high tech, you know, biotech, um, you know, we call it STEM uh, industries, 
And so I'd love to get your perspective about some of the trials, tribulations, opportunities you've seen over, over the time. Have you, and have you seen differences for women over the years? Yeah, no, I think, you know, I've always been involved in industries in which, you know, women leadership has been underrepresented. Um, so, you know, I was in consulting for many years as, as a way of started. And, you know, even that industry has made great improvements, um, but still um, not necessarily all the way there over the years. And so, you know, what I see is, you know, with women leadership, it really has to do with mentoring and support. Um, I found myself very fortunate from an early stage to have managers, to have bosses who believed in me, who gave me opportunities to grow and stretch outside of a, you know, very formal, rigid title or job role or job position. Um, and I feel like that, you know, that has really helped. And, you know, whether or not those managers or, or mentors were men or women, right, I think that that um, has, has, I've had both of those. And, and that is really, you know, as someone working their way up junior, I look for companies that have role models in that sense. I've definitely left companies in which all of the senior management was unfortunately white male. Um, and so it, it's just as difficult and those companies still exist in this day and age. Um, I think that even um, companies that try um, uh, to, to have more diversity, it's an effort, it does require, um, time and effort. And so I, I do see improvements, but I do see quite a ways to go in that regard. And yeah, I, I think that is one of the problems that a lot of times with women getting leadership positions, being trusted in that point is because often, and you see this with even with minorities, um, you, you often have the prove it mentality, right? In, in order to be able to step into a leadership role, you're asked to show that you've done it before. Whereas that often is not the case with um, our male counterpoints or our Caucasian counterpoints who are, again, trusted that they can grow into it more so in that ability. So I think that's why it's been so important to have mentors that believe in you, that give you that experience and, and believe that you can grow um, into the roles. Yeah, I mean, I think these are really great points. And you know, the thing is there's just been this landslide of, of you know, change that's just, you know, hit us like a hurricane in the last year. So alongside COVID has been this complete social upheaval, um, you know, Black Lives Matter and, you know, all kinds of work around inclusion and diversity. And, uh, you know, in, in ingrained in all of that is, um, was unfortunately a whole bunch of other stuff that sort of surfaced to the top conspiracy theories and cancel culture and all of this has been built into this melange of stuff right and we're just sitting in front of this how do we navigate through that how do we sort of cherry pick those things and try to recreate some semblance of a shared reality when we've seen through this that everybody sees everybody could be looking at the same thing and then seeing that they're seeing something different like how do we get back to the science and how do we get back to the basics of like free speech and inclusion and diversity that somehow like bring it together where it's not this big place of disarray? Yeah, no, I think everything that you've said, you know, being here in, in Canada, you know, allows us a little bit to kind of, you know, ignore the noise of what's happening south of the border especially with the border being closed. But those of us who have a lot of connections down there, unfortunately, still do hear about it and do still live and see its impact, not only down in the US, but the impact here in Canada and, and on us as well. I think what's missing from a lot of these um, conversations are dialogues, are listening, right? I think there's a lot of people that are talking at each other, but not talking to each other. Um, and I think Part of that has been, unfortunately, the social media amplification, where you can have, you know, messages that are strewn across to thousands, if not millions of people, but you're not actually having a conversation. Conversations need to be in smaller groups, kind of one on one, um, to really, you know, not only to hear and listen to the other side, but also then to share your opinions in a 
more rational, non-emotional, not heated or charged manner. Um, it's a lot easier to get heated when you've got thousands of people around you. You know, if you're just one-on-one, -on -one, you're much more willing to listen. You don't want to get into an argument necessarily and have a conversation. So that's what I feel is missing is, is these kind of really tight knit, closer one-on-one -on -one conversations. Um, and that unfortunately is, is what I find missing also in this virtual world of conferences is you can just those kind of coffee chats that are one-on-one -on -one are uh, much more difficult to have. And so that's why I appreciate things like that you've been organizing like these fireside chats is, you know, just to get to know somebody and share conversations, share viewpoints and opinions in that regard. We talked a little bit earlier in our conversation about some of the digital technologies that we're using, telehealth, wearables, you know, we talked about how it applies to decentralized trials and, you know, diagnostics, et cetera. But we also realize that there's sort of a dark side to the web. We were hearing about it more and more. We heard recently about the solar winds issue in cybersecurity and all kinds of things. Where does that fare for you? And what does that look like for us in the future? How do we, how do we start and manage that conversation around health data, privacy, security? And is there going to be such a thing in the future? Yeah, I think that's a really challenging question and conversation. Um, you know, I, I think I'm somewhere in the middle. I, I hear from a lot of people uh, you know, friends and family, you know, when a lot of the, the technology companies, for example, kind of the, the big brouhaha with WhatsApp um, and sharing the privacy data and, and a lot of people saying, well, I'm not going to use this platform anymore and moving on to other ones, which may or may not have actually been equally problematic from a safety or a data privacy point of view. Um, I think that we do need to have some sort of data privacy and, and some sort of health privacy. Um, I think, unfortunately, you know, because it's, it's such a big industry and because, uh, you know, this really needs to run in an economies of scale type of way that you are going to need big companies who are managing health IT, um, in that regard. And they're going to need some way of being a company that can monetize it. Um, so unless the government is going to take over and completely control data, I, I think that you're you're always going to have these uh, juxtapositions and these tensions between individual privacy and companies who have the resources um, to manage it, but need to somehow monetize it. Um, so I think that's definitely going to be a problem. And I think that, again, it comes down to a level of trust right now. You know, nobody trusts governments to do this but people also then aren't trusting the commercial companies either. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, unfortunately I, I don't have an answer in this regard. <laughs> I think it's definitely a, a challenge um, that we're gonna be consistently facing in the next uh, decades. I think it, you said it very succinctly earlier where we're, we're flying the plane while we're building it. So this is all unfolding as we're, we're, we're living through it, which is, makes it equally very interesting. Um, we are seeing a lot of other changes happening digitally, you know, everything from the FDA developing guidelines on, on uh, digital transformation, um, software as a medical device, uh, new billing codes, you know, everything and is, you know, and that's actually equally happening in Canada. We're seeing more apps coming into play. And these apps, some of them actually have gone through the proper clinical trial process and actually are you know, being compared to standards of practice and actually getting public reimbursement. You know, we're seeing a lot of these things in, in diabetes and other, other sorts of areas with metabolic syndrome, uh, you know, those sorts of things. So what is your viewpoint about the future of the pharmaceutical industry? Are we really doing things and thinking about things beyond the pill? Is the pharmaceutical industry going to really be the new consumer electronic uh, type of entity? Is it going to become the new Apple or will it work with the Apples and the Googles of the world? What does this look like for you? Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And I, I do think that it is where the pharmaceutical industry is moving towards. Um, a lot of the big pharma companies do have digital health arms, kind of, and even very senior kind of VP or, or C-level, you know, digital health executives to manage this, um, right? It's, it's, not about 
kind of replacing the pill, but it's how do we see everything in a holistic situation, as you mentioned, from, starting from diagnosis, through treatment, through monitoring um, afterwards. And so, you know, I, you know, I, I see at this, at least the initial point, it, it is going to be partnering with the Googles and the Apples of the world um, in that regard. Each side has its own expertise. Um, you know, I don't think that they'll be able to really um, read upon the other ones um, as much, and uh, especially with the regulatory thoughts coming in for health, um, right? It's, it's, you're, you're talking about people's lives. So unfortunately, the, the regulatory side is always going to be there much stronger in healthcare than with the more generic consumer uh, uh, electronic goods. Um, but I do see that this is where we're going and how we're going to have to think about everything on a more holistic basis. Um, you know, I think you talked about, you know, diagnosis and it's, you know, one of those things that, and codes, it's one of those things when we were at Genentech, you know, you got codes for reimbursement once a year. So if you launched your drug two days after the codes came out, you had a year where, you know, physicians had no idea how to get the drug paid for, but patients needed it. Um, so it was, you know, but as, but now with digital, um, you know, avenues, that doesn't, you don't need to only meet once a year and create all these codes once a year, right? You can do it on a much more regular basis and, and get diagnosis, get drugs and treatments to patients, you know, on a rolling basis. It does make it a scary proposition though, because in some ways you can say that the regulators were leveraging those inefficiencies to give them control over overarching um, healthcare costs. So this is going to be the new frontier of how do we manage innovation and the exuberant costs that it's going to have on society. I guess the last question I have for you on that note though is, is the expansion and amplification of health and wellness. Mental health has been especially an issue since COVID, having access to you know, apps and a whole bunch of other healthcare um, interventions. The question comes down to as, as everything that we've seen in the COVID is that this is an, a K economy, meaning the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. So it's the K economy. So you have one part of the graph going up and the other part going down. Part of that one could, one could deduce is that this also applies to the haves and the have nots as it relates to healthcare, having access, not perhaps, for example, even having the proper internet so that you can access a patient portal or a telemedicine you know, uh, you know, interaction with a healthcare provider. Um, so what do you feel this, is going to have the, 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 the upside of technology, we certainly can see this, but do you think that there will be a detrimental effect on, on the, the more vulnerable or the less fortunate in society when it comes to healthcare management? That's really interesting. And I don't think I've heard of the, that K economy term, but it makes a lot of sense um, now that you visualize it for me. Um, and I do think that that unfortunately is where we're headed. And so, you know, how do we prevent that from happening, um, as you said? And I think it is gonna require a lot of effort and attention, right? And it, it requires a society to care. And I, we see that, of course, much more in Canada than we do in, um, you know, in, in the US because we are, we have universal health care um, as part of the societal um, contract with each other. And I think that that is, uh, you know, that's just what's going to have to continue is folks are going to have to care that um, that this is happening because, you know, it, the the way that the technologies are there lend themselves to this, um, the K economy, as you have said, kind of going up and going down. And so you need much stronger efforts to be aware of it and and prevent it from happening and, and try to raise up those vulnerable communities um, and, and kind of acknowledge that uh, we need to spend time and effort there. I love it. So beautifully said and a great way to end this. We're at the top of the hour. This has been a fantastic conversation. We're so happy that we have wonderful female leaders like yourself in the healthcare space, um, leading the way, encouraging and inspiring lots of people. Uh, for those of you who are watching the show or listening to it, we will be leaving uh, contact information for Allison Gaw. In case anybody's interested in speaking with her, connecting, partnering, uh, we will leave that in the show notes.
We also encourage you to take a look at impetusdigital.com. If you like this conversation, these are the kinds of stakeholder conversations we have authentically with many healthcare providers, payers, patients, allied healthcare providers in these very um, specific touch points where they can share ideas, gather insights and collaborate over a series of touch points using virtual asynchronous or synchronous uh, interactions. So check out Impetus, please like or subscribe to our channel so you and others can find our materials. Uh, we thank you all for taking the time to being with us. Thank you so much, Allison, for your time today and wishing everybody a great day ahead.